Hey folks and welcome to the channel. Now before I start I want to make one thing perfectly clear. This video is in no way shape or form intended as a console bashing video. I enjoy playing on my PS4 and despite building and mainly gaming on PC I'm more than happy to sit down in the living room and sink a few hours into Uncharted, Last of Us, Gran Turismo, you name it. For me it's all about the games and the PS4 has got many great games. But with that said, let's not kid ourselves about the PS4 being any sort of powerhouse. This console generation has generally underwhelmed so much players with its bargain basement PC based hardware at their hearts. For someone interested in PC technology however, this is kind of a good thing, because it means we can pick up a PS4 GPU for less than the price of a $60 console game. Meet the HD7870. Now this is a GPU that I picked up on eBay for a whopping sum of £40 plus postage. Now I say that this is a PS4 GPU but that's not really the whole story, so let's take a look back to 2012 and see what's going on. AMD released the HD 7870 in March of 2012 and it was very much praised for the performance it offered. It was built in a 28 nanometer process and based on a Pitcairn graphics processor. It features 1280 shading units, 80 texture mapping units and 32 ROPs with a 2GB GDDR5 memory buffer connected using a 256-bit memory interface. The 7870 operates at a frequency around about 1GHz and its memory is usually running around about 1.2GHz. At the end of the following year, the PS4 hit the scene and the GPU located in the PS4 system on a chip was again built on a 28 nanometer process and it was Pitcairn based. This time it featured 1152 shader units, 72 texture mapping units and 32 ROPs. The PS4 as a whole can address 8GB of GDDR5 memory but it's shared with all other components in the system and again this is on a 256 bit memory interface. The PS4 GPU operates at a frequency of 800MHz and the memory is running at 1375 MHz. What that description doesn't tell you however is that the PS4 GPU is architecturally the same as an HD7870 but with two compute units which each feature four texture mapping units or TMUs disabled. This is done for a number of reasons and it's mainly to increase yield numbers. Semiconductor manufacturing is it's a complex process and there's inevitably going to be variation within each batch produced. The more complex the component, the higher the likelihood of there being bad or unusable samples within each batch. If you think about it, as of the start of 2017, there's over 50 million PS4s in the world, so you can understand why both AMD and Sony wanted to be able to produce as much usable components within each production batch as possible. So by allowing chips with less than the standard 20 compute unit to get that green tick seal of approval, it greatly increases yield. Likewise, setting the bar for the GPU clock speed below that 1 GHz standard to 800 MHz, it means that it would again increase the amount of usable chips in each batch. Since the GDDR5 memory is not actually located on the AMD APU, different quality procedures could be placed for these parts specifically for it to be able to achieve 1375 MHz, a higher clock speed than normal to try and mitigate for the scaling back of the GPU capabilities. So with that mouthful out of the way, what does this mean for our HD 7870? Well, other than creating a custom BIOS to disable two of those compute units, we can't exactly match the PS4 GPU specification, but we can exactly match the floating point performance, the texture rate and memory bandwidth with some cheeky clock manipulations. With only the pixel rate, because it's a function of the core clock speed, deviating slightly from the PS4's theoretical performance. I'll add the calculations in the description, but I'm pretty sure it would bore you to tears if I went through it here. So as you can see by the table, we've reduced the core clock of the 7870 to 720 MHz. This allows us to gain a floating point performance and a texture fill rate that's exactly the same as the PS4. And we've increased that memory clock to the same 1375, which effectively gives us the same amount of memory bandwidth as the PS4. Now before we get cracking with the benchmarks we need to address the elephant in the room and that is the CPU performance. Now my Core i5 it produces 473 gigaflops or thereabout. The PS4 CPU on the other hand it only comes in at 102.4. Now this is generally due to a the lower clock speed and secondly the lower instructions per cycle that it can actually carry out so regardless of the fact that it's got 8 cores which is double of this Core i5 we just can't see the performance that we get with 
any modern desktop CPU. In fact, if we wanted to match that performance, we would need to go back to 2007 with something like an overclocked Q6600 if we was wanting to match the exact performance figures of that PS4 CPU. So by coupling this PS4 spec GPU with a much more powerful processor, we're going to basically remove any sort of CPU bottlenecking that we might see and it's going to allow us to see what the GPU is actually capable of. So let's run through a few benchmarks with set and set at console level or above. I'll also indicate the frame rate you'd expect from the PS4 up in the corner as well. First up we've got Tomb Raider 2013. I've decided to use the Ultra preset in this and we're getting 62 FPS on average. Looking through some of the details on the PS4 version, we can see that we can't actually hit 60 FPS on the PS4, but there are some drops around about 40 45, so it kind of hovers somewhere in between that. Next up, we've got Skyrim SE. I'm using the medium preset and God Ray set to low to try and replicate what you could expect from your console. And we're averaging at 47 FPS. On the console, the PS4 runs at a locked 30 FPS. Next up we've got GTA 5. Now this is a game that the PS4 runs locked at 1080p at 30fps. On this configuration here we're hitting 60fps on the high preset with FXAA turned on. Finally we've got Battlefield 1. I've run it at the medium preset again at 1080p and it averages out about 53fps on this PC configuration. Now if you've played Battlefield 1 on PS4, you'll know that the frame rate is highly variable. There are areas which will hit 60 FPS just fine, and there are other areas where you're going to be dipping below 30. And while we never seen frame rates that low on the PC, it's still a very taxing game it appears for this GPU configuration. So where do these results leave us then? Looking at older titles, Tomb Raider and GTA 5, both which originally surfaced in 2013, the results are really good. A steady 60fps on this rig is technically achievable with the GPU. Moving on to newer titles like Skyrim SE and Battlefield 1, we see the average FPS start to dip below those levels. And we can start to understand why so many games of this generation start implementing that 30fps lock. So from these results it's clear that the PS4 GPU was more than adequate for 1080p gaming on its release. Nothing stellar, but with good optimization it can perform. The Achilles heel of the system, it really seems to be that mobile based CPU that nestles in that Jaguar APU package. When running these benchmarks the CPU usage was certainly not getting maxed out on my computer, but it wasn't exactly twiddling its thumbs either, so it's clear that the games can and will use more processing power than is ever going to be available on the PS4. With that said though, the fact that the PS4 is certainly hamstrung by its brain only really serves to make those first party games like Uncharted 4 and the upcoming Horizon Zero Dawn just seem that little bit more impressive to me. Now I hope you've got something out of this video today, I know it's a little bit more long winded than usual, but hopefully you'll now have a better idea of what's actually powering today's consoles and how they compare to relatively inexpensive PC hardware. And if you've came across this video and you're a staunch console gamer, then I'd honestly love to hear where you think the console manufacturers are going to go from here. And if you think that moving away from using cutting edge technology, like was the case with something like the PS2 or Xbox 360, was a mistake, and if you'd like to see them challenge one day at the top again. Anyway folks, I think I've probably rambled on enough for one video. Tell me what you thought of it in the comments below and use those thumbs if you want, and if you haven't done so already, you can consider subscribing and checking out some of the other content. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching the channel, and I'm sure I'll see you soon.